it's a good uh, thing uh, to be able to come together on the first day of the week. For us, it's already the beginning of the week in Israel. We don't have names for our days of the week like you do. Sunday and moon day, you worship different things. Um, we call our days first day, second day, third day, fourth day. The only day that has a name is Shabbat, Sabbath, because it's the Hebrew word to cease from working. But that's it. Today is the first day of the week. That's why in the gospel, it's the first day of the week when they went to the tomb and found it empty. So it's wonderful to start the week coming together and studying the Word of God. And it's my honor to be here again. The topic of the message this morning is the tree of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that we can come together and look into that precious, precious book that opens our eyes to understand who you are and your heart, your wisdom, your desire, and your love. We thank you and we bless you. And we ask that you will sanctify us by that truth because your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, six months ago, as I was uh, speaking in Europe, I actually started in the UK and on my way to Italy. Um, my wife thought that it would be nice if her father would join me because he needed some time off. He, was, uh, he needed to get out and just breathe some air. He, had, he was under a lot of pressure in Israel. So uh, I designed the tour uh, so I can also have some free time with him. So we met in Catania in Sicily. And uh, the following day, we had a wonderful day together, um, touring one of the most beautiful cities in Italy called Taormina. And then uh, we had uh, dinner in his, ha in his room. We brought pizza to the room. We, we ate pizza, and uh, we said good night. And we were set to meet for breakfast before I went to speak in a, co a prophecy conference there in Sicily. And uh, I went to have breakfast and he wasn't there. So I went to the front desk, asked if he's there. He wasn't there. So I went up to his room and I found him dead. I found a body without life. Now, bear in mind, he was not just my father in law, he was my father. He was my brother, he was my pastor, he was my friend. He was a lot more than just a father-in-law. And I was standing in front of him, as he's on his bed, and I saw a body, but there was no life in it. Life was sucked out of him, because he was somewhere else. He was at the presence of Jesus, but I am stuck with his body. <laughs> and uh, it was emptied from life. There's life in every one of us. But when life comes out and we are going to be with him, then the body is just a cluster of cells that is going to be buried because it will soon get wrong. And I remembered how Adam was created. God is the one who gives life, remember, in Genesis 2. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So first the body was formed. And then... He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And I saw a body without the breath of life because he already finished his race. And he's now at the presence of the Lord. And I'm standing right in front of him. And I know that my life will never be the same. The family will never be the same. But I know where he's at. 
and I'm watching a body, and I've seen bodies throughout my, dead bodies throughout my military service many, many, many times. And some of them were not even intact. But this is my father-in-law. This is someone that I just had dinner with. And um, there was no life in it. And when God created Adam, look, it was God who breathed life into his nostrils. Life comes from God. Without the life that God gives us, we are nothing but a shell. And man became a living being. Suddenly, he can smile, he can walk, he can talk, he can think. And the Lord God planted a garden eastwards in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow. And look how God is into the details. He loves aesthetics as well. Look he says every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Those were beautiful trees and very tasty fruits. And Adam was full of life. Because there was a source of life in that garden. And he was walking with that power of those endless lives, supposed to be endless life. Because he has yet to do the thing that God told him not to do or else he will die. You see, there is no doctor that is able to give life. Multiple authors in scriptures recognize that it is God who is the giver of life. Job in chapter 27 says, As long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 5, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. In Daniel chapter 5, Daniel is speaking to Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He says, but you his son Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hands and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. This is almost a picture of California today. I mean, when you offer a bill that ends the life of a baby that is already born, not, you know, you're not even arguing about while it's still in the womb, although we learn that from the moment of conception it is already Life that God gave. But, but look, he said, that same God who holds your breath in his hands and owns all your ways. It's just, he's the one who gave you breath. He's the one who gave you life. He's the one that owns all your ways. And the only one that is in charge of all of this, you do not regard. And what do you worship? Trees. What do you worship? Nature. What do you worship? Stones. All these things that cannot give you life. God planted those trees for you. Not made you for the trees. Acts 17. Paul is in the heart of Athens speaking to all those smart guys there. And he's saying to them, look you guys. You worship so many weird things. God is not worshipped with men's hands. He said, nothing that men will craft. God is not like that. As though he needs anything. Since he gives to all. He's, he's not speaking to Jews. He's not speaking to believers. He's speaking to those 
University of California, Berkeley, what, I don't know. He's speaking to smart guys that think they know everything. And he says, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So what is the tree of life? You see, I looked at my father-in-law. I'm seeing a body and I'm thinking, wow, he was so... You see, that night before, when I went to bed... I heard he called all my family members before he, he went to bed. And I heard he left, he went down to the front desk and he told them that he cannot get back into his room and he needed a key. And, and the, the front desk uh, guy said, okay, come to the elevator and I'll take you back to your room and I'll open the room for you. He says, no, I'll, I'll run upstairs. You can take the elevator if you want. He was full of life. Now, the tree of life is a tangible, a real tree in the Bible. But also, it was used as a word picture to describe things in metaphorical context. Similarly to how wisdom is used in regards to the Holy Spirit many times. And there are several metaphorical references such as Wisdom was likened to the tree of life. In Proverbs 3, it says, She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. It's also likened to be the desire, the hope. Hope deferred, uh, deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. It also refers to speech. The Bible says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. And did you know that while in the garden, access to the tree of life was not forbidden? Did you know that the tree of life was right next to the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And God never said to Adam and Eve not to touch from it? Did you know that anyone who wanted could go and take from the tree of life? In fact, the tree of life was a source of life. There is a source of life that God is giving to mankind. And there is a source of knowledge that will cause them to think that they are like God. And they just had to choose. Because God doesn't want robots. He wants people with free will. You see, what if you have children and they are programmed? To say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's not the kind of love you want. That's not genuine love. That's not love that comes from the heart. He's programmed. You want him to choose to love you. You want him to genuinely say that he loves you. You want him to genuinely follow you and learn from you. And be your successor in life. So God created Adam and Eve, and there was a choice there from the very beginning. Do you want the life that only I can give? Or do you want to be pretending that you are God? And guess what? You know the end of the story, don't you? In Genesis 2 verse 9, the latter part, it says, The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden... And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were right next to each other. And in verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man saying. Of every tree. Say every. Every tree of the garden. You may freely eat. It's like take life. Take freely. It's for nothing. I don't, I, you don't have to pay for this life. It's a fruit. It's a tree. Take, eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. And he's telling them also. For in the day that you eat of it. What's going to happen? You will surely die. God is saying to Adam and Eve. I don't want you to die. I am telling you, there is a tree here 
from which you can eat. It's the tree of life. But I'm also telling you there is a tree I'm telling you not to touch and not to eat from. Because if you eat from it, you will surely die. It is a God that sanctifies life. It is a God that wants to give life. It is a God that is warning us from a, a terrible mistake that might lead us to death. So when was the tree of life forbidden? Because a non-believer, from the moment Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, a non-believer has no access to the tree of life. That's it. When was it that the tree of life was forbidden? Right after the fall of mankind, right after sin entered the world, right after that rebellion, right after they chose death. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like us, one of us to know good and evil. In other words, he wants to be God because someone told him that he is like God. Now lest he put out his hand and take also of the fruit of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, separated the man from the presence of God, separated the man from, 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 from the love and, 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 the, and, and the life that was given to him freely. And he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden. And a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. A tree that was widely available and accessible. A tree that God said, you know, you can eat from it. A tree that gave life is now forbidden. Why? Because they made up their mind. They made up their choice. They chose what? Death. As you can see in Genesis, Adam only experienced the tree of life prior to sin entering the world. But once sin entered the world, he was removed from God's presence. It is a terrible thing to be removed from God's presence. Likewise, it is our sins that separate us from God. Look, if, if you have, are not a repentant person, if you have not been born again, you are separated from God. You can pray as much as you want. Lift up your hands, give millions of dollars, dance, fall, laugh, roll, whatever you want. You're separated. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And God communicated that to the people of Israel in Isaiah chapter 1. He said, no matter what you do. You pray, you spread your hands, you give me all of the best of the best. I'm turning my, 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 my face from you. I'm not going to listen to you. Because your hands are full of blood. He says, wash it. And then let's reason together. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin... See, sin looks fun. You know, well, let's try the fruit. But then comes death, and death is not fun. Death came to the world, and, this, and that death spread to how many people? Say all. all. All men. Because all sinned. It was so bad that in chapter 6 of Genesis, the Bible says that God was sorry that he created men. Because man was only having evil things, evil thoughts, all day, continually, all the time. Can you imagine? From one sin, one time, in a garden, to all day long, all the time, everywhere. It spreads. And don't tell me you're a good person. None is good according to the Bible. Now, life is everything. We, we kind of like to cherish life, you know. Every country builds military because the military is supposed to protect the country in order to protect the life of the citizens. We put billions of dollars in, in vessels and in, 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 in ships and in destroyers and in carriers and in F-18, F-22, F-15, F-35. 
billions of dollars just so we can live. Governments are governing in order for us not to kill one another without law and order. Some governments uh, promote law and order, but it's a different story. We try to stay healthy because we want to live. We go to work so we can have enough money so we can live. We get education so we can find a good job, so we can make enough money, so we can live. We go to entertainment so we can have fun, good life, because we want to live. It's all about life. All about life. And the one thing that gives life, people push aside. They want to preserve life. They want to have good life. And the giver of life is not regarded. Ezekiel 33, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God says, even the wicked ones, I don't want them to die. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. God is not interested in killing people. Let's see whom I can kill today. God wants all to live and therefore, he wants them to come to the understanding that they need to turn away from their, uh, turn their, uh, from their sins and live. He wants to give you life. He is the one that breathed life to the nostrils of man to begin with. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God had to kill his only son so whosoever believes in him should not die. But have what? Eternal life. Life is what God wants you to have. In Genesis 9. Look at how life matters. He says. Surely for your, la for your lifeblood. I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast. I will require it. And from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother. I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood. By man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. God made man in his image. He will not allow people to cheapen it. To call it a cluster of cells that you can kill in order to have a good lifestyle. In order not to worry about some you know, nine months of pregnancy and then food for the baby. God is saying, I am the giver of life. I value life. And I am going to demand payback for every life that you take. That's what he's saying. Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. God formed our inward parts. You covered me. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am what? Fearfully. And what? Wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. We're not just... A bunch of cells. We are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. Where? In the womb. Oh no, in the womb. It's not a baby yet. Well, now you want to kill it even when it's out of the womb. That criteria is no longer anything of a debate anymore even. God. From the moment there is conception, there is life. And God is there. Jeremiah the prophet can tell you that. Chapter 1, Jeremiah says that the Lord is speaking to him. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was not even born. And God already had everything planned for him. He ordained him, he sanctified him while he was in the womb. If you're pregnant now, God is blessing that baby. And it doesn't matter if the baby is exactly what the doctors want or not. Our fourth baby, the doctors told us, 
bad news. And they expected us to get rid of it. And we didn't. And the, the doctor that performed the, 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 uh, the birth, the delivery, um, basically was the doctor that told us to get rid of it. And the baby was born perfectly healthy. Yeah. But listen, if I was someone who would believe the doctor for that report that I have to get rid of it because something doesn't look right in some of the, I don't know, I guess protein levels or whatever it is. He wanted us not to have the baby. They, okay, let me tell you this. They wanted us to kill the baby. Th th this is it. We can be alive yet still be dead. Colossians 2 says, You being dead in your trespasses and the uncirc uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. You see, you... If you're not a believer now, you're alive, but you're dead. Oh, I want to preserve my life. I'm working out five times a day. I'm eating healthy. You're dead. <laughs> you're a nicely bodied dead person. <laughs> You'll die healthy, probably. <laughs> because the Bible tells me that the, from the moment we were born, we were born in sin, as you know. We were already in the camp of the condemned. That's why I always say after John 3.16, there's John 3.17. And after that, there's John 3.18. And it says that when you believe, you're now not condemned. But if you don't believe, you're condemned already. Only through Christ, you will be plucked out of the condemned already into the not condemned. And then you get life. You're not just alive when it comes to moving and talking. You're alive. You have a new spirit. You have the spirit of God not just around but in you. Working in you. Leading you. Showing you all things. Leading, guiding you through all truth. Comforting you. Encouraging you. You can be alive and yet dead. But once you're saved, you can die, but still be alive with Jesus. John 11 says, Jesus told Martha, if you remember, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me, never die. Do you believe this? By the way, this is the rapture. Why am I saying that? Look, he says, if you're dead as a believer... You're going to be resurrected. But if you are during the rapture alive, you will not die. <laughs> That's the only two options for a believer. But he's asking her, do you believe it? You can go to church every Sunday. Hear the word of God every Sunday, every Wednesday. And not believe. Jesus had this experience with, with two of his disciples. His own disciples. His own disciples that were in the upper room on the day of his resurrection. They saw the report of the women coming telling them that the tomb is empty. That the angel was, was, was there revealing itself, himself to And then the angel said that he's alive. And all those guys said, oh, okay. All right then. Weird. And they left Jerusalem. And the Bible says they're walking and walking and walking. And they're angry and sad and confused. And, they try to reason with one another. And, and then Jesus whoosh, walked right next to them. <laughs> and then he asked them, uh, what are you talking about? And you look so sad. Are you the only one that does not know what happened in Jerusalem these days? All the things? And Jesus asked them, what things? <laughs> and they told him, the things. 
concerning Jesus. And I love it. Jesus is listening about Jesus. <laughs> Tell me about you. Oh, he was there and then. And the, the, the priest condemned him and he was crucified. We thought he will be the Messiah, but I guess he's not. No. <laughs> and then they go on and murmur and murmur and murmur. And then, and then he said, and even now it's the third day. And two women came and told us that the, the tomb is empty. And, uh, and they're angry and sad. And he looks at them and he said, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe. This is what I can say to so many churchgoers nowadays. They go to church, they hear. They don't get it. Because they don't believe. 1 Thessalonians 5. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake, like you're old now, or sleep, like some of you now. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> Now, sleep here means if you're dead in Christ. We should live together with Him. We will all live together with Him. He wants us to choose life. You see, life is a choice. I can't understand why people put pro-life versus pro-choice. This is bad grammar. Bad English. I'm not in, uh, you know, English is not my mother tongue. But I know a little bit about English, okay? The opposite of pro-life is what? Pro-death. Not pro-choice. Choice and life actually should be together. Let's read Deuteronomy 30. Look what he says. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God. To walk in His ways and to keep His commandments, His statutes and His judgments. That you may live and multiply. Not kill your babies. Live and multiply, he says. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them I announce to you today that you shall surely perish he said look you want to die go ahead I can tell you how to die disobey me <laughs> go the other direction I'm telling you there's a precipice you're about to fall you're about to die but if you choose to what am I going to do listen to me he says you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in, in and possess if you don't hear my word. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And let's read together. Therefore, choose life. Pro-choice is pro-life. Not Pro-death is not pro-life. This is it. Don't ever let them confuse you. That if you're not pro-life, you're pro-choice. Life is a choice. And God is telling us to choose life. It's a choice that you have to make. We had to choose to keep the baby. And he's perfectly fine. And he said... Choose life that both you and your babies, your descendants, may live. Not only you. When you choose life, it affects you. And it affects your babies, your children, and their children. Don't stop with you. I want to live. I want my baby to die. No. When you choose life, it should be all the way. Now... Who is here to kill, steal, and destroy? You all know that. Look, I can't imagine that people want to kill other human beings just so they can have a better life. I can't, I mean, to me it's too much. But I can understand that they do that if someone is telling them to do that. If someone is whispering to them that it's actually good, it's better, it's desirable. In Genesis 3, and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat. 
You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And what is the serpent saying to her? Oh, don't worry. You shall not die. He's a liar. But you know, not only a liar, a deceiver. A deceiver is someone who knows the truth and tells you the opposite. He's a liar and he's a deceiver. When you don't know the truth, you're just making a mistake. But when you know the truth, you're a liar. And you're a deceiver. That's who he is. He knows that God sanctifies life. He knows that life, choosing life, this is so important to God. So he's telling you to choose death. He's telling you, oh, by the way, you'll not die. Don't worry. Take from it. John 8. You're of your father, the devil, and desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. A murderer, killing people. That's who Satan is. And does not stand in the truth. It's a lie. To kill babies is a lie. It will never make you happier. It will never satisfy you. He says, he is a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's who he is. And Jesus saying, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have what? Life. Not just life, that they may have it, what? More abundantly, not just the joy of... You know how many Christians I know, how are you? Saved by grace. <laughs> oh, the joy of the Lord is not your strength. 2 Corinthians 4, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds... The God of this age has blinded. Who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God should shine on them. First Peter says in chapter 5. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion. And a roaring lion is not walking around to just give you life. Trust me. He wants to devour you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you, seeking whom he may devour. So who is the one that not only originally gave us breath, but is also the giver of life again? See, <laughs> a lot of people think that they are born Christians. I don't, I don't get it. How can you be born a Christian? It, it's not even in the... I see, I don't speak English good. But in the English language, you cannot be born a Christian. Did you know that? Why? Because Jesus said that a Christian is someone who is what? Born again. Born again. You cannot be born born again. <laughs> you have to be born first in order to be born again. So you have never been born again once you were born. You had to go through life. And trust me, when you were a few days old and somebody sprinkled some water on your head, you're still not born again. Or if you're a Jew and you're eight days old and you're still not born again. <laughs> Listen to me. To be born again is to be born from above, from the Spirit. It has to come from you. You have to obey the calling of God. It has to do with you, not with your parents. It has to do with you, not with something else. You, <laughs> I don't know how many of you here are born again. I, I have no way to know, but God knows. But I can tell you one thing, going to a church can make you a Christian just as much as standing in the car garage make you a car. <laughs> you need to be born again to be a follower of Christ, to be a Christian. And to confuse you even more, Jesus was never a Christian. What are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Jesus is not a follower of Christ. He didn't have to be born again. Jesus is God. He is the Christ. Okay, when you follow Him, you follow God, you follow Christ. You're not following a born again. Oh, I thought Jesus was a Christian. No, He wasn't. He actually was a Jew, if you want to know. <laughs> John 8, 
John 5, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. If you believe in Jesus, you will have everlasting life. You shall not come into judgment, but you pass from death into life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Wow, I, as a 17 year old, planned carefully my suicide. I wanted to die. I grew up without parents. I grew up in a foster home, 12 other children. I had no proper, nice, beautiful childhood, and I didn't like it. So I thought, well, I don't know why I'm around here. <laughs> and I'm not here to just you know, punch this card and say, I was here. If it's not going to be anything meaningful, I'd rather not live. And I carefully planned it. And that night, I remember I was, I was covered with, with cold chills. And, and I said, you know what? I'm going to give this universe one last chance. <laughs> that next week, I, was, uh, I went to my friend's home. We studied together for the um, high school diploma uh, uh, exams. And, well, you know, I'm on a seafood diet. When I see food, I eat. And, and, and we, so we're around the table. Lunch was about to be served. I'm about to grab the fork and the knife. And suddenly they're all holding hands, closing their eyes. And I'm looking around myself. You guys are used to it. We're not. So, and then the father closed his eyes and started praying. And he's saying some words like he's talking to God as if God is his best friend standing right next to him. And he's even thanking God that I am there. And he ended up the prayer with, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Yeah. I lost my appetite. <laughs> What's that? Why do I need to end a prayer to God in the name of this guy, Yeshua, Jesus? So I asked, who is this Yeshua thing that you're ending the, the prayers with? And they told me, and they tried, and explained, and Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Hosea, and Micah, and all of that. Everything is great, but I don't understand why I need to pray in His name. Is God not enough? So one of them told me, why don't you ask God? <laughs> now, me and God are not <laughs> best friends at that time. And I said, how am I going to do that? What will I say? She said, well, ask Him who Jesus is. <laughs> Okay, so I took a piece of paper. I said, God, please show me who Jesus is. I put the piece of paper on the wall. I nailed down and I read from it. I was afraid to say the wrong things. Lest the thunder will come and just kill me or whatever. <laughs> Listen. It. So I pray. The next morning I wake up. I go to work before school. Since I'm 12, I've been working. Because I worked for the business of that foster family. It was a grocery store. I opened the store at 6 a.m. All the dairy products I have to put in the in the fridge, all the fresh bread on the shelf. And then came my favorite part, was putting together the pieces of the newspaper. And I would read through the newspaper. And I opened the newspaper, Yeshua! <laughs> I closed the newspaper, I thought I lost it. <laughs> and slowly, slowly I opened it again. It was still there, it's the advertisement for the Jesus film of Campus Crusade. Showing in a regular movie theater in Jerusalem for two nights only. I thought God lost me so much. He threw out all this production just for me. <laughs> and th wow, they work fast here. <laughs> I went to see the Jesus film. That night I got saved. I went, listen, wait. I went back home. And we ate dinner apart from the foster family. They had the, the foster kids eating this food around this table. And in a different place, they ate their food. So I always didn't like this thing, but for the first time, I loved it. Because now I can talk to everyone without them knowing. So I started telling them about Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 9, Isaiah 7. I, I liked them, most of them. I, I skipped only one that I didn't like. <laughs> and you know God has a sense of humor. Because he's the only one that responded. 
<laughs> and I'm stuck with him for eternity now. Now watch this. I was dead. I wanted to lose my life. And now I found it. God gave me new life. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. None of you will ever get to see the kingdom of God. None of you will ever be able to see the tree of life again, unless you are born again. If you don't know what it means to be born again, it means that you must repent Acknowledge that you are a sinner. Repent. Ask God to forgive you. And invite Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior and the captain of your ship. You have to move aside and no longer try to take the ship to wherever you want. Let Him. And from that moment, God will send you the Spirit. His Spirit. You will be sealed with the Spirit of God, which is your Arabon in Greek, Arabon in Hebrew. Down payment to already your salvation, your redemption, your eternal life. And that's it. From now on, death has no more power over you. That's it. Even if you die, you will be alive. To, for us, to live is what? And to die is gain. What kind of people say that? Save people. John 10, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. John 14, Jesus said, I am the way. He's not telling that to the Gentiles, he's saying that to the Jews also. There are churches that teach us that Israel doesn't need Jesus. Israel has its own covenant. It's dual covenant that they teach. Big churches, famous pastors. I'm not in the habit of naming names. But no. <laughs> no. But I will tell you that Jesus is telling the Jews, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Say no one. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. No one. Jesus is the key to returning to the tree of life. The tree of life will only be experienced by those who inherit salvation. Revelation 2.7 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to what? To eat from the tree of life. Which is where? It's in the midst of the paradise of God. There is a tree of life. We're going to see it again when we enter into the promised eternal Jerusalem, the new. It's there. Revelation 21. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look, there is going to be another death. If you are a non-believer, you are going to have bad life, one death, and then resurrection at the end of the millennium for the great white throne judgment for the second death. But if you are a believer, you have the security of your eternal life now, you may have one death. It's not even sure because the rapture happens now. You're not even going to die. And then, for those who have part in the first resurrection, the second death has no power over them. Amazing. Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruits every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No, a lot of people think that when we get into the New Jerusalem, it's after a beautiful period of the thousand years millennium. 
Well, it is after the millennial kingdom, but the millennial kingdom is not going to end up in a nice way. If you read, you know that at the very end, after a thousand years of no Satan in the world, he's locked up in that bottomless pit, God will release him for a short time just to see that when the time comes and the great white throne is going to be there and he will judge to see who is really following him and who is not. And I can tell you, multitudes will join Satan at the very end. After they've experienced the millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ in flesh will reign from Jerusalem. All of us, the believers, right now you're ambassadors. You will be governors. Better than this one here. <laughs> and I can tell you folks, all of us will govern, all of us, but we will govern over people that will break our hearts. Because at the time when the test is coming, so many of them are going to turn against us and join Satan. And trust me, when we get to heaven, we will need, <laughs> look what it says, healing of the nations. The word healing in the Greek is coming from therap therapeutic. And uh, it's a very, very interesting thing. The Greek word used for healing is therapiao, therapian, from which we get the English therapeutic. But it's also known as to, care, to, to be caring for, or to have better life, good life. But I want to tell you something. Believe it or not, but uh, there's a portion in Revelation 22 that uh, many of the English Bibles have a, a minor mistake in them because they follow what we call the Texas Receptus, the, the, uh, the uh, accepted texts of those days. It's basically, um, it refers to all printed editions of the Greek New Testament. There was, there was a, a Catholic um, theologian, um, his name was Erasmus. And Erasmus was a Dutch, and he wanted in 1516 to print one book of the Greek New Testament. But there were two verses that were missing in his manuscripts. So what he did, he went to the Latin, and he took those two verses and translated them into Greek. But as he did that, by a mistake, the word ligno was translated to libro. And therefore, you have this verse that says this. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take his part from what? Originally, in the Greek, is the tree of life. Ligno. What that man ha unfortunately did, he, called, he, he translated it to Libro. That's why we have the book of life. But in none of the early translations and in none of the early manuscripts of the Greek, it was, lig it was Libro. It was actually Ligno. So actually, God will take away from any non-believer apart from what? The tree of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Anyone and everyone in the New Jerusalem will experience the tree of life. I saw a new heavens and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. All you surfers, ha ha ha. And look what he said. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. God will have a New Jerusalem, beautiful, but there will be no temple in it. And God will be with us. We will see God. We will be with God. There will be fellowship non-stop between us and Jesus. The Bible says, just like it was when God was walking in the garden, remember? We will have the same thing. And by the way, the Aramaic translation of God walking in the garden, the Aramaic translation is the word of God walking in the garden. Memra, 
the Adonai, the word of God, Jesus, was walking already in the Garden of Eden then, and he will walk into New Jerusalem with us. Together, no more temple needed, no more, no more sun, moon, or stars needed. The Bible says, Jesus is the menorah. He will shine his light. By the way, which light? The same light that was in the first day of creation. If you remember, when was the sun, the moon, and the stars created? Day four. So where was the light of the world from on day one? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> we are going to have everything restored. But it has to be restored. Even heavens have to be restored. Heavens is tainted right now with the rebellion of Satan and his demons. It has to be a new thing. Untainted. Undefiled. It's going to be amazing. God will wipe away. We will come to the new Jerusalem, I believe, with a lot of tears. Yes, we will have our glorified bodies and it will be nice to have a body that is, you know, no more need for diets, no more need. You will never be late. I mean, listen, it's going to be wonderful, okay? But we still have emotions. The emotions are there and we will be heartbroken from how the millennial kingdom was ended. And the Bible says, when you enter the new Jerusalem, then and there, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Blessed are those who do his command, uh, commandments, that they may have the right to the what? Tree of life. And may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So that means anyone who believes Satan who is a liar. The believer even now has, ac has access to eternal life, but he will see the tree of life in the future when we enter into that city. Jesus is the one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry. All of you are priests, you know that? How many of you have the family name Cohen? No one. Levi. Lewinsky. Never mind. How many of you? Listen, all of you are probably Gentiles. You're not even Jews, but you're but you are already priests. He elevated you from people who had no hope and no God. You are now his holy nation. You are priests. Just like Jesus who was not a Kohen and not a Levi. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. According to the ancestry, he actually could not be a priest. But he is our high priest because it's based on what? On the power of an indestructible life. And that's the power that he's giving to all of us once we choose him. The power of his endless or indestructible life is the portion of every believer because sin has been dealt with. And the same source of life that turned Jesus into our high priest is the same source of life that turns us into priests the moment we believe. So I'm asking all of you, are you going to experience the tree of life? I, I'm sorry. Okay, but now the second question is, will you point others to the tree of life? Proverbs 11:30: the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Father, I thank you for your word, for your promises, for the fact that you love life, you created life, you are the giver of life, you hate death, and you want men to choose life. And you warn men from the destruction and death. Father, we pray that today people who hear this message, based on your word, will turn away from their wicked ways, reconcile unto you, and believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And come and repent and receive you as Lord and Savior. 
We want not only to experience the tree of life, but to point others to it. We thank you. We bless you. You, the giver of life. You, the one who is now giving us the access back in the future to that tree of life. We bless your name this afternoon from this place. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.